Welcome everyone to the Open Schooling Showcase. I'm Daniel Charney, Director at Forth and part of the Make It Open UK team. Uh, this is uh, the third year of this research and it's the stage in which we opened up the pilots for other schools to join through a hub, uh, working in partnerships and reaching as many schools as we could and trying out the learning scenarios that we were developed. Uh, some of this we'll talk through, but um, this is really um, mainly to say hello and and also with the main idea is to explore what open schooling is and how it can be, should it be, and how it can be part of the future. Um, we're looking at uh, a few examples first, so I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to talk, uh, jump straight in to a few case studies from schools around the UK. Um, and... Uh, just to say that everyone involved was asked this question at the beginning. This is the question that started the research consortium. We were working through lockdown. So there was a lot of inventive workshop formats, uh, which kind of suits the situation, but it also made for a quite a challenging environment to work in open schooling, as you can imagine, and you've all done as well. Um, so to explain where we are in terms of open schooling. It's within open learning. And it, this project really focused on science education within open schooling, make it open, started with a series of pilots and then grew, but remains within science learning, maker education. So that's a bit of framing uh, for us. Dee Halligan will speak about the relationship of open schooling to open learning at the end, at the uh, summary stage. So I'm going to just uh, jump right into a few examples along those years that we've been running it. Um, this is in the Derby High School. They developed their own uh, zero waste school learning scenario and ran it very successfully in, in collaboration also with a great science share and the change makers program but they really have um, an amazing approach towards making young people uh, lead the projects and take responsibility and they involved policy makers and industry they then involved other neighbor schools they created an environment and they they won the, a bid to get this bus and turn it into a classroom in their uh, in their uh, area uh, so other schools could come and learn and share so a lot of open schooling aspects here uh, another school we worked with quite closely jubilee primary school in uh, brixton london they developed a number of lesson scenarios but in the one that was uh, dealing with a local issue of pollution they really got to grips with the understanding how how to uh, capture and, and create data and also how to think about the nearby park. They had experts, um, they used a parent network to find their experts. So that's again, an open schooling characteristic. Um, another school, which we'll hear about a lot more. And so I'm gonna just touch on this very quickly because one of our speakers is Ro Rose Edmondson, who's going to talk about her experience in Fallange Park High School. Uh, Fallinge or Fallinge? Fallinge Park High School, let's go with that option. So yes, again, uh, created their own uh, lesson scenario, a lot of outdoor, a lot of uh, curriculum links with uh, biodiversity, but also part of an international competition, connecting to other schools. And uh, a lot of aspects of the open schooling came to uh, become very much part of this. Uh, again, Jubilee, we're looking at the idea of an outdoor classroom um, and around another scenario of let it rain, responding to the school vision of learning outdoors, but also in, involving other people in the school, other staff, and uh, initiating things that will last beyond the project, like the compost bin and the garden, and involving parents and 
Again, the Derby High School, this was one of the case studies that was really impacted across the consortium because the students developed, devised and delivered the lessons of this, uh, of this uh, program. So they had a day, a special day at a local theater where they worked with experts, uh, undercover police officer and nurse to uh, develop the materials and then went and delivered it to their peers in their classrooms. Um, and there was a real crossover of subjects also. Queen Elizabeth schools, these are two schools who collaborated around issues of waste in their environment and uh, worked together continued a previous project in which they were looking at um, the neighborhood, walking around and talking to uh, community uh, partners. They then gathered a uh, hundred of them in the school hall and the two schools collaborated on ideas, which then are presented back to the neighborhood. Millfields Community School, took the, one of the lesson scenarios from the pilots called Healthy Snack and uh, ran it across the whole school. So 360 children on a day of looking at healthy snacks and um, each year doing a different activity, but they shared some of the learning and then opened up uh, the other. And they were excited that everyone was doing the same uh, kind of project in a way. Again, another, another school that took on the healthy snack um, and uh, ran it across the, uh, uh, all the years with all the teachers getting involved, a lot of parent involvement. They were taking it as part of the National Science Week. In both cases, they uh, linked it to curriculum uh, uh, needs in the school here in, 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 in terms of biology. And in the previous one, they were looking at food miles. Each of these schools really um, picked on different aspects. Um, and then we uh, also created a, a partnership with uh, Lynn Bianchi, Dr. Lynn Bianchi, who's here, um, around getting all the Make It Open schools to be part of the great science share for schools, which happened today. So we're very pleased that Lynn is here. And Lynn, can I invite you to... Uh, say a few words about the great science share, your work with schools and experts, but also just to mention uh, full disclosure that Lynn is also one of our expert advisors on Make It Open. That's right, Dan, so slightly biased, I suppose. But yes, we're absolutely delighted and thanks for the opportunity to talk to um, people on the call today. Um, so the Great Science Share for Schools, you're quite right, has uh, culminated today, but there will still be schools who might be um, doing the events uh, over the next few weeks, we still see that. Oh, what is the great session? I'm feeling quite quite tired today, but what today has signified is um, well, hundreds of thousands of children doing something very, very simple, asking a scientific question, investigating it, and then sharing their evidence with new audiences. So what this has now done over the past eight years, as the campaign has grown over time, has, has gone from something which was very regional, just operated here in Greater Manchester, to something that now goes across 31 different countries, which I, I'm always staggered when I got that figure yesterday. Um, about 4,000 organisations, which could be schools, it could be zoos, it could be cultural organisations, museums, hospital schools, lots of different places where children get practical, really. Because to, do, to work scientifically, they are handling uh, scientific equipment, they are gathering data. I mean, t today downstairs, there was everything. There was everything from demonstrations of pig's hearts. Children of age seven could articulate everything about the structure, the function. Um, they, they were experts. They had absolutely mastered this. Others were doing physics-based flight investigations, exploring the use of ballast and how ballast influences plane flight. There were others who were looking at um, all sorts of issues around sustainability. Um, they were exploring the, how glass can be a really useful uh, protection ag uh, against global warming and uh, ice cap melting by modeling it with chocolate. There was all, I mean, it was just tremendous, but the, the beauty of this, and I think what, what 
also cuts to the heart of, of the Make It Open is that we are placing the children in a position of authority, uh, that they are the knowledgeable people within the room. They're not listening to others who pass on their knowledge. They're developing knowledge alongside experts and they are in partnership in that learning experience. And I think Dan, that you're nodding. So I feel that that's what brings us together. So it, that brings us together that the, in all the photos that you've shown, children have not been, been done to. They, they have been leading, they have been developing not just skills and knowledge around science or other things. It's those transferable skills for life, the leadership skills, the resilience, the problem solving. Um, yeah, the context is just not superficial. It's important, don't get me wrong, but, but the, those are the skills, skills for life, really. Yeah, that, Lynn, that the Great Science Share is part of CIRHI, and you, That's right. you work a lot with uh, schools to help them connect with experts. Could you say a word or two about that? Yeah, yeah. So Siri uh, was, um, is a hub here at the University of Manchester. I, it, I launched it nearly 10 years ago now. It's, it's the Science and Engineering Education Research and Innovation Hub. Um, we engage in, well, we, we offer teachers um, professional development of a whole range of different styles, some which are very typical courses, but others, as you say, Dan, are working in partnership. They could either, they could either have, uh, and you've got Rose on the call here, uh, you know, Rose spent a year or more with us, so her, uh, yeah, she's, <laughs> there you are. Um, so that was a massive different type of CPD to come out of school for two days and to embed herself within a team within a university setting and to use that as a CPD experience, connecting with all sorts of different scientists and engineers. And I mean, we are, go on. Sorry. Yeah, no, we, we also have uh, a bit about that from an expert to hear the actual point of view of an expert involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we'll link. We'll link a lot of schools. Uh, Anna, Anna Poshowski will be able to say from her experience. But I really am amazed that you managed to join us today. So <laughs> thank you very much. I mean, five hundred and twelve thousand okay. seven hundred and thirty. Yeah. Well, they didn't all cut turn up to to my yeah. door, but they are all out there. Uh, some of them fantastic. were part of Rose's uh, project yesterday in Rochdale, and we'll hear about that. And then. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, Lynn. That's we're okay. Here. So what is open schooling? We've seen all these things that were mentioned happening. And really, in terms of uh, its relationship with open learning, these are, are the kind of arenas in which open learning can be uh, pushed or expanded. We're not going to be talking about each one, but rather uh, move ahead to the discussion about uh, open learning. But I wanted to share a bit about the background of the research uh, that started three years ago, looking at the qualities of open learning. All this material is online in our um, website and also the Make It Open uh, website. And uh, in terms of our focus, really, uh, in this case, the main benefit that we're concerned with here is in the community and the teachers. But uh, in all these cases, it's, it'll be interesting also to understand the changes that are happening in and are necessary in schools. And we'll hear, we'll hear from Malcolm Grove about that. And I hope that becomes part of our conversation. And we developed a number of tools. Dee will mention some of them. This is not the place to talk about the tools themselves, but um, one key thing was a structure that was shared across the, all the schools, this structure of phases, and these 16 tried and tested pilots that serve as inspiration in many cases. Um, they have a, a navigator, um, tool online that enables people to think about the aspects and ask these questions and maybe that means that it turns this whole open schooling thing not from a situation of a happy accident but into a culture of collaboration and tools that make it easier to do. In terms of here in the UK what we did in our hub is take all those lesson scenarios and structure them a bit more around climate education that seemed to be uh, of more interest to the teachers. And re in response, we created these themes, or we, we cur curated these themes, and we saw that people uh, picked up on these 
And we hope that the resources will remain uh, useful beyond the research project, of course. Uh, in terms of how it was run, some uh, projects were run across a term, some through STEM week, and some of them one day. Um, and uh, we created a response to a science week offer and also in response to the strikes, which made it very difficult for some schools to pick it up in spite of being very interested. But it's time to just say a big thank you to ever to everyone that was involved um, and also to just give a bigger, uh, broader uh, explanation. The Make It Open uh, project was run across 10 countries. Um, it's EU funded, it's an international collaboration, and it had in its core uh, aspects of mixing open schooling with the maker education and rethinking the boundaries and equipping people to be able to um, prepare and respond to the world we live in. So this is happening in other countries parallel to us, but just to give you a, a, a general uh, uh, sense of the numbers, it's about 29,000 people that were involved. Um, our focus was teachers in our research um, and also uh, the team that worked on it. Um, will be able to, and I think it's time to also uh, mention that some of the advisory group are here. So um, thank you very much for um, guiding us. And also, I hope we will be able to hear what you uh, think about how it's, uh, it could be part of the future. So the team has changed a bit along the way and there are growing network and partnerships, um, but which we hope are the beginning of something rather than a kind of closed uh, circuit of the project. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand over to our speakers now. Um, this is a really a great uh, opportunity to hear from different point of views, people immersed in the Make It Open project and people that have looked at the field for uh, a few decades and have an overview of the changes and the changes needed. So we'll uh, invite uh, Rose uh, Edmondson, a teacher of science and secondary schools for over 20 years. She's been uh, uh, involved in also doing the online course and the Make It Open and devised and delivered her own uh, lesson scenarios. After that, uh, we'll have uh, we'll hear from uh, Anna Korshaisky, uh, a materials scientist, and Malcolm Groves, uh, who uh, will talk about the future-facing school, among other things. So, hi, Rose. Hello. <laughs> great to have you here. Great intro. Thank yesterday, you. Yesterday, the big great great science share event with. Uh, eight other schools was it yeah it was yeah so eight other schools just yesterday so yeah i'm yeah. um, so still we're... high from from doing that um okay. and from seeing the students talking about that today so um yeah Shall I'm, I gonna, I'm gonna my... sign out in a minute and then okay. hand it over to you okay so uh yep Thank you, Daniel, for a lovely introduction. Um, I'm Rose Edmondson, currently a teacher at um, Failing uh, Park High School in Rochdale, um, but lots of people say it differently. Um, it's an 11 to 16 um, school where I'm quite fortunate to work with a team who really uh, promote community and um, allow certainly me and our community team to engage with our community partners. So um, I have about seven, eight minutes to just talk about these two main uh, bullet points, really, which is um, just to tell you a little bit more about our context um, and why uh, and how really we've gotten involved uh, with this project. Um, and also just to start looking at some of the impact now that it's having um, and what it might mean in terms of our school for the future, in terms of uh, the department that I work in, which is science, um, and as well as the community team, uh, and just to uh, give a little bit of um, sort of an insight into what we've learned uh, going on this journey. Uh, so to the right of the screen there, you can see that um, we have created our own 
uh, little learning scenario and it features around moss which if you'd asked me a year ago whether I you know <laughs> whether I knew very much about moss or um, whether I would want to um, set up a learning scenario linked in with that I don't think I would be giving you the the answer that I'm going to give you uh, today so um, if I just sort of give you a, a bit of an overview of, of us and this is just a little picture from our website and uh, you can see at the top there's lots of tabs um, but there is a tab that's um, um, linked in with our with our community and um you can see in in that link when you look on there at the very bottom there's a link to science which is sort of the area that links into the department that i've worked in for um three years now at failing although i have been teaching for more than 20 years um but the thing that we do at failing is we uh, look to work with communities so it's a two-way dynamic so we learn from our community partners as much as what they learn from us really and it is very much um, a partnership and a collaborative partnership and uh, so I just put that on there just to sort of showcase that actually it's um, the way we communicate it is is changing slightly um, and we're quite lucky that we can share what we what are what we succeed in doing and some of the projects that we're doing with our families and with the wider community as well so there's our um, website that sort of has that summarized or is starting to have it summarized and um, so uh, last year and um, towards the back end of the year before, um, I was asked to lead the Eco Champions, which I was a little bit nervous about. And um, because my my background, although it's biology, I didn't do uh, my my proper background is microbiology. So um, I, don't, I don't know so much about or I didn't know so much about ecology. But um, we managed to secure some funding from the Royal Society and we started exploring biodiversity on our school site which is a site where we are close to the town centre, but we do have quite a large space that we can explore um, and use. And so we set up a project with the Royal Society. I knew I wanted to extend that project and looking at the resources that were available through Make It Open, I knew that it would make me develop this project in a way that I need, uh, that was, it met our needs and it would allow me to really think more deeply about how to engage members of the community um, and how we can keep that two-way process going. Um, so I managed to uh, link in with uh, Rochdale and what they wanted to promote. And one of the things they wanted to look into was improving um, peatland and replenishing peatland. So I thought, mm, this is this is interesting. So uh, I knew of somebody already at a university um, who was working on moss and looking at the invertebrates in moss. And to some of the sort of links that I was starting to make, I thought, well, maybe this could be the overarching theme um, because moss gets quite a bad reputation, I think. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I can turn it around and uh, make sure that the people who we engage with um, understand why moss is so magnificent. So hence the learning scenario um, that we created. So. Um, if you have an interest in learning a bit more about what Rochdale plans to do in terms of that, uh, there is a, um, there are links available and I can I can make those available. But um, the Rochdale Council are very keen to replenish moss um, and have quite um, a number of spaces that they're looking at at the moment. And we managed to find a moss expert in Calderdale. So in terms of where we are, um, it's over the border in Yorkshire where um, I'm now involving uh, conversation with that community member. Um, but also more recently, I've come across another moss expert, which I'll tell you a bit more about um, later on. So, um, and that's just some of the, what they're interested in, in improving. So they're looking at um, biodiversity in its widest sense. Um, so we decided to hone in on, uh, on moss. So um, in terms of how we started, to, or how I started to look at designing our um, learning scenario, um, the way it's structured really allowed me to think about um, every sort of aspect, how it linked in with our experts in our community. So I knew we already worked with Touchstones, so um, we carried on that partnership and uh, talks about biodiversity to Jenny over at Touchstones um, and learned from her um, so that when we went to on a visit to Broadfield Park, um, there was moss a lot, you know, everywhere um, in that park. And we managed to make links with this project there. Um, and, uh, you know, even though I was sort of planning to, uh, about how we would involve our community partners, actually, when you're out and doing it and in the thick of it, you realize that there's more links to be made. So although, you know, the learning scenario that I've developed, it's 
I think one of the things I've learned is it's a dynamic and it just changes. So as your project grows, um, you realize actually if another school was to pick this up, um, even though the sort of structure would be the same, the experts that they might involve and the direction that they might go out, it might not be quite the same as, as, as where we're going. And it is, again, very much directed by the students and what their interests um, are. Uh, so um, the the research part of it is sort of, sort of the area that I think we spent more time on um, that we didn't realize we were going to. Um, and certainly we're at the creation or the uh, creating phase now and the sharing phase is sort of coming together. Um, but uh, for us, it's just how, well, for me, especially having those prompts there, the guidance is very clear. Um, it allowed me to think creatively and um, think in a slightly different way in how to engage um, our, our community. Because it is so community centered, um, I think that's key really, because the students appreciate that what they're learning in the classroom um, and what they're learning in school, it's, um, it links in with their wider community and the community in Rochdale, it's very close knit. And sort of having that link with what we were looking at in particular with climate change and biodiversity um, made that, um, brought the, that context alive really for them. And now we're looking at weaving this um, into the curriculum. So I know there's some colleagues who are looking at um, interlinking it with GCSE subjects um, as well. So that's somewhere where maybe we can look um, to go in the future. Uh, so in practice, we started off looking at um, our community, thinking about where moss might be, asking the students to go out and handle the moss, um, bring it back into school and then start to explore it. So look at it as a micro habitat. So this was sort of in um, the linking the preparation phase to the sort of doing a bit of research and linking um, that into what kind of um, habitat is it what invertebrates inhabit it and what do they feed on so a lot of the students um I haven't put a picture on here but they um I gave them tasks to do to take away and do in their own time and so many of the students have come back and a lot of the teachers actually some of the teachers as well have come back to me and sent me Im uh, images of where they found moss and so our moss map is 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 getting um bigger uh even now so well, you know although it's linear it's not really linear I think you know people can get involved at various times um, I found some resources uh, online uh, linked to Moss Safari, so we made use of those. Um, the student that really, really helped the students and and helped them to make connections to what they'd already learned about in the curriculum as well, because they knew about habitats, but micro habitats wasn't anything that they'd explored before. And so linking in with our uh, work that we did yesterday at the Great Science Share, you could see the fascination with the primary students, you know, the younger students who are sort of eight, nine, ten, who knew because a lot of them in year four, they study um, habitats, but they hadn't seen a microhabitat like this before. Um, and of course, they then start to say, oh, you know, I've got that in my garden. So um, it's just so context rich. Um, we uh, had some um, moss um, it, sort of experts take a look at, I'm still not sure what this um, this image is, but I think it's an invertebrate called a rotifer, but um, we've engaged with people online as well. So in social media, um, you can see here are some of our students who are starting to look at how it's a sponge for pollution as well. So it absorbs um, a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and pollutants. And we're just starting to look now um, at making the links between moss and um, engineering and materials. Um, as well and we started to make some um, moss terrariums we made one of those and we're going to carry on um, involving parents and families now um, and bringing them in to do some workshops to talk about the moss um, and what the students have learned as well um, and uh, we've, we've just every time I think I've got uh, enough moss experts somebody else <laughs> will get in touch with us so um, last week I had another moss expert from um Rochdale get in touch um there's a big celebration of nature happening at Heaton Park in a few weeks so this experience and um sort of the make it open project um I think it's just going to continue to grow um and it's going to be something that interweaves into our curriculum and into projects that we do as a whole school um for a long time to come really um and uh, Rose, you know, can I, 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 I could talk all day about it really yeah, but that's, exactly. uh, a quick overview, really. that's why I'm, I'm jumping right in just can you just mention the competition the international competition yes. and we'll finish yes. with that. yeah so um 
because I, I did um I did go to the AAC conference in January this year and uh, came across um Casey who's from Earth Echo International and she works with um yeah she 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 works with a big organization that's very much about students taking ownership um for making a difference in their local community so because of everything that we were doing we put a bid together there was a lot of hard work we had three year nine students who um put that together um and yeah we weren't expecting it at all but we did um win first prize so we have the funds now as well to make um to sort of continue this project really also, we've seen that competitions can be a very good structure for open schooling because of that engagement with other organizations and partnership. But this project seems like it's um, got a good start, hasn't it? And yeah, it really has. And I mean, that I didn't realize, you know, how much of an impact just having your name out uh, in the media. I was just going to ask one last contact, question. So. How difficult was it to get it going in terms of senior management in in the school? Um, if for, our, for our context, it, it wasn't so, so difficult, but I can imagine it might be. Um, but I'm the sort of person who is quite persistent anyway. And I'd probably continue um, <laughs> to push it until they sort of said yes. So, you know, anyone who's sort of thinking about it, I would I would say, you know, just continue you know if it's something you absolutely believe in or just you know make it fit for your context you know i i mean you, you have good support uh, from the community side uh, uh coordinate yeah. and that yeah, I, mean, be... I mean it's taken to work with touchdowns we've been working with them for a few years um so some of the some it has taken years to to build that relationship but uh, I, I shall stop sharing now we're <laughs> going to head straight to uh Anna Poshaisky, who's a London-based award-winning material scientist and took part in yesterday's great science share with Rose and, and the 10 schools. Um, so Anna is, is a material scientist, but also a, a storyteller and workshop leader and has worked with schools. In fact, we, uh, we almost met when we were both talking to uh, on a kind of... Um, practitioners day to uh, to secondary schools um, and there was such excitement from the students uh, that heard you that I then went and got your book mm -hmm. and also um, that's the other thing that I hope you mentioned so uh, thanks for joining us Anna and I'm handing over to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and thanks everyone for being here um, and for yeah getting involved in this. My role I think on this panel, I'm going to talk to you from the perspective of a scientist working with schools. So as Daniel said, I've been working with schools as a scientist for a decade now. That has encompassed lots of different sorts of work from delivering shows on stage um, and in the classroom with demos, like quite long form talks and shows, sort of an hour long type thing with slides and all the rest of it like flashes and bangs and liquid nitrogen and all that fun stuff um, but I've also worked with schools as a mentor um, with older students who are wanting to meet someone that's been to university and get an idea of how they can get into science through that route and I have most recently been running creative writing workshops with science classes as well, because as Daniel mentioned, I'm also an author. I've written a popular science book called Handmade, A Scientist's Search for Meaning Through Making, which was my, a sort of naive scientist's journey into the world of making and craft. Um, and through that, I've got involved in some schools, workshops and teaching storytelling in the context of a science lesson. And I've also been teaching storytelling to physics teachers to try and get stories and creativity into physics lessons as well. So lots and lots of different areas of my work. Storytelling is, I guess, the backbone to all of that. And I'm also, what I'm really fascinated in is being able to bring science and engineering to places or settings and audiences that are traditionally underserved or in some way aren't don't feel welcome in science or don't feel permission to be involved in science and to get going with it. Um, and of course, of course, schools is a huge, huge part of that. So today what I thought I would do is to reflect on my experiences as a scientist who's been working with schools in these various different ways and to particularly focus on 
some of the challenges that I've encountered and then reflect upon how open schooling can be a huge part of changing the sort of rut or the challenges that I found myself in. So challenge number one for me personally is that lots and lots of people, teachers, students, families don't know what material science is. Now, this is quite a me specific problem. <laughs> material science is a relatively niche subject. Um, one Welsh university that teaches material science at undergraduate a few years ago had less than five students apply to them. Um, it's not taught as a subject on its own in the way that maths, physics, chemistry and biology are, um, because it itself sits in between those subjects. It's sort of like the physics of materials and the chemistry of materials, and there's a bit of design technology in there as well. So material science often finds itself as a topic or a kind of sub little niche in those subject areas, but it's infrequently presented to students as a viable career option going forward. So that's one challenge is just lots and lots of people don't know that material science is a thing. Challenge number two is for me, how to sell science and STEM to students. So the question that's plagued me throughout my career as a relatively public facing scientist is why should anyone care about this? Just because I think material science is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> that's not a good enough reason for, you know, standing up in front of people and expecting them to care about what I've got to say. So throughout my career, I've called upon tools from the world of story and storytelling in order to help answer that question of why should people care? It means using narrative and story structure and creating vivid worlds and characters that enliven the stories of science. None of the science that I ever talk about is there because it's a fun fact. It's there because it's part of the narrative. We have to have it you know, as part of the story. And some of the approaches that I've taken have been to have my, in this story, to use myself and my story as a protagonist to demonstrate from the point at which my audience are, from the age and the situation that they're sitting in, telling my story and showing them what's possible if they choose a scientific approach, if they choose a scientific career. Um, so that's problem number two, how to sell material science to students. Question number three is how to measure the impact of working with a school because most often a, an external scientist will come in and work with a school for an hour or two maybe half a day if you're lucky and then they go home again and they don't get to see the longevity of that lesson or that interaction so you're often relying on teachers and family of the students to help interpret what they've seen, to make it relevant to what they've seen. And those teachers need the support to do so. Um, the impact of scientists interacting with schools can often be on the time scales of months and years down the line before that impact you know, really becomes apparent. So that's a challenge then for me as a scientist to understand whether what I'm doing is the right thing to get the feedback and to understand how to measure the impact going forward. Challenge number four is to do with access and equal opportunities. Um, I work as a freelancer, so I don't have a university affiliation. I don't have a salary that is paid for by someone else that would allow me to come and spend time in schools. So that means that almost all the time I have to charge a fee in order for me to be able to put the time into developing materials and delivering materials, which of course poses the huge access and equal opportunities dilemma, because that means that lots of schools and students won't have access to that sort of, um, to that sort of thing. So the way that I've generally come around that problem is to speak at events that have an economies of scale model. There are companies like Education in Action and GCC Science Live that congregate many, many schools um, together in a big, big venue and bring scientists in to talk to them at scale. 
and that provides a model that means that I can afford to do that sort of work and it means I'm not out of pocket at the end of it so there's there's a, a tricky thing there about being able to um, remunerate scientists for their time if they're people like me who don't have an institutional salary to fall back on the problem though with those big events is that because they are so vast you don't get the type of quality of interaction that you would in a small group in a classroom it's we're talking scales like hundreds sometimes thousands of students on any one particular day so that's a real challenge is how to make sure that you're allowing at equal opportunities but also being able to have those um, more one-to-one -one interactions and then the final challenge is one of network because the vast majority of schools that I end up working with are people who um, are already in my own professional and personal network. Um, they contact me because they've heard me through Twitter or through my book or through my other online content, um, or they're, like I say, part of my professional network already. It can be really hard to connect with schools beyond my immediate circle, beyond teachers that spend time on Twitter and, you know, that spend time in circles that I exist in. So that's a big, big challenge is how to expand that network and meet people that I would be able to work with. However, this is where I think the open schooling um, approach can help to solve all of these problems. So if we think about the hands-on nature of this, um, material science specifically, like I've said, is a very interdisciplinary subject. So these sorts of approaches then that are interdisciplinary by nature that have to call upon different parts of the curriculum in order to solve a scientific problem, that is like material science gold. <laughs> that's, that's exactly the sort of thing that will help scientists like me to get our message out there. Selling it to students in terms of the story that they go on, the brilliant thing about this is that the students sell it to themselves. <laughs> so it's really easy for scientists because they're already on board with it. They're already um, part of the scientific process themselves. So there is no big sell needed from someone like me because they're already doing it. The support to measure the impact, the support of networks, the support for access and equal opportunities, all of these things are really, really helped by these types of networks and these types of approaches. So with that, I'll stop there. Um, that's been my perspective as a scientist and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the so rest many. of the panel. Thank you, Anna. It really, the, first of all, it's great to hear that it sounds like there is uh, an affinity between, in terms of the approach, but um, we really have that same experience of trying to reach people beyond our existing networks. And that's where partnerships come in yeah and a big time and also organizations such as the one that uh, Malcolm Grove leads mm -hmm. um so we're going to move to uh Dr Malcolm Grove who's worked at the forefront of educational innovation for I'd say uh, more than most of us and um embracing the whole range from primary to secondary and youth work and adult education. So it's a great pleasure to invite you, Malcolm, to uh, reflect on the relationship of uh, the, uh, this idea of open schooling with your work, um, but also to uh, share with us uh, your latest uh, book and approach. So um, uh, thank you. I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Daniel, and thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, to join the session and to share some thoughts. And I think what I've been asked to do really is to sort of put the sort of bigger context of uh, education thinking and how this might connect with the sort of um, detailed projects that have been so excitingly described by um, Rose and Anna. Um, and Schools of Tomorrow is a community interest company. It was set up by school leaders. It is owned by schools who choose to become members and therefore co-owners uh, and about 30 schools uh, from uh, all sectors, uh, nursery, primary, secondary, special and uh, from England, uh, from Wales, from the Netherlands and from Spain. So it's quite an eclectic mix, very randomly dispersed according to uh, friends and networks that, that we have. Um, 
but uh, what I want to do is just to share with you some a little bit of our journey over the last 10 years um, as we began by a group of head teachers coming together um, in 2011-2012 um, and wondering what um, we might make of the changing national policy context that we were facing. And um, what we came up with uh, was the idea of writing down some key beliefs uh, and circulating to friends and colleagues that we knew, seeing what sort of response it drew. Uh, and this is at the heart of uh, that manifesto that we produced and the three statements that you can see uh, on the screen, the three propositions, um, I think are exactly resonant of the make it open uh, approach and philosophy. Um, so I draw your attention particularly to the last paragraph, which was an attempt to stress these are not just uh, nice ideas and good to do. They are actually based on hard uh, educational research. Um, uh, and my friend, the late great Professor John Westburnham, had a habit of asking audiences uh, a question. Um, so I thought I would share with you his question. Um, uh, there won't be time for you to ponder an answer, but the question is, what connects these three things? See what you think, but his answer was, of course, that they are all now obsolete. And they are obsolete because something different had to be tried in order to improve the performance in, in their different areas. Um, mail didn't get delivered faster because we got better at training horses. It got better because of the arrival of the railroad. Um, improving the propeller did not make planes perform better and fly faster. It was the arrival of the jet engine. Something uh, completely different, rather than trying to keep working on improving what existed. Um, and uh, John, who played a, a huge part in helping to set up Schools of Tomorrow, um, said this uh, at our launch in 2013. Um, we had enough of incremental improvement. We need to start thinking differently. Uh, and his answer to what the educational equivalent of the jet engine was, um, was contained in the idea of social capital and the school as a builder of social capital as the best way to improve outcomes of all sorts uh, for children and young people. Um, and that was the sort of thinking that we try to take forward within schools of tomorrow. The challenge, of course, is that we don't start with a completely clean sheet and we have to deal with the reality of today in terms of the uh, government, the buildings, the people, the students that we have here today. Um, but our thinking was contained within that four quadrant framework um, and it was looking to rebalance um, what the purpose of schooling might really be. And that's about linking uh, high levels of achievement, of course, although we might choose to define achievement more broadly than it sometimes is defined in policy terms. But that requires high levels of well-being, actually for everybody, not just students, for staff, for families and communities. Um, it's about effective preparation for the future. And all of that requires engagement with families and communities. But it was that uh, third quadrant about preparation for the future that uh, gave rise to a lot of rethinking as a result of the pandemic. Um, and John and I tried to capture uh, what we were thinking at that time in a book called So What Now, uh, published by John Catt, available on Amazon. Um, but what we were trying to do was to address that statement about given what the pandemic made abundantly clear was a really challenging and precarious future for the whole of mankind, um, uh, what does it mean for young people who are going to have to try and sort out some of these problems, uh, huge uh, 
really deep problems uh, from uh, their elders, uh, people like me uh, and you. Um, and it was quite stark. Um, this particular quote is about climate change. It could have been addressed to different areas, but in terms of climate change, we know that there is only a very short window of opportunity to bring about change in the way that we live, in the way that we work, uh, in the way that we think about the world that we inhabit. Um, and this uh, quote produced by the uh, IPCC in 22 came out uh, actually five days after Russia invaded Ukraine. And you might have thought, oh, it's another distraction. And of course, those distractions have been here for a long time. Uh, this document, A Blueprint for Survival, um, I remember teaching a sixth form general studies course about that in the 1970s. It came out in 1972, sold 750,000 copies. It was produced by 30 of the leading scientists at the time, and they were very clear about what would happen um, if there was no change in the way that we thought uh, about our environment. Um, uh, and actually, there has been no change, and that's why we are where we are today. Um, and the last bit of this jigsaw of thinking about the future is to say it's actually not a problem of science and technology. Uh, and as Gus Speth, a scientist working for the UN, came to realize it's actually a human problem. Um, it's about us and we need to look at people uh, and the way that we educate in that um, if we're gonna create real change. So all of that came together uh, in our thinking in the book to say, what part can education now play uh, to do things better? Because it's clearly not been that successful in the past in terms of helping create a better tomorrow. Um, and the problem that we uh, tried to characterize as was captured in this uh, little chart. It's produced by Alison Gopnik, the uh, American uh, child psychologist. Um, and uh, she drew the comparison between carpenters and gardeners. Uh, carpenters, uh, take wood, a preformed product, and then shape it to the design that they have in their heads and make it as they want it to be. Um, gardeners uh, are engaged in a much more nurturing process of organic growth and development. Uh, we think that's quite an exact parallel between schooling and learning. And part of the reason why we're failing is that schooling as an organization has taken precedence over learning. So you can see, again, a robust uh, basis for the thinking of uh, open schooling and open learning. Um, there are some systemic weaknesses which I haven't got time to address, but our argument and the evidence took us towards saying there are three characteristics that schools individually and collectively can work on to produce um, uh, change and a more just and sustainable future for all. And that's about deep understanding, really understanding uh, material that you learn about. Um, uh, so in the case of climate change, it's not just about uh, knowing that the climate is changing. And these are the reasons it's about understanding what really lies behind that. Understanding is not enough. You have to want to do something about it. Um, character, uh, the intention to do good with the knowledge that you have. But particularly for young people, it is agency and the uh, motivation and the ability and the encouragement to act on what you know. And so for schools of tomorrow, it took us to a notion of a future facing school, which I think is very resonant of um, uh, open schooling philosophy. And we came up with these uh, nine characteristics categorized into three groupings thinking holistically about purpose, a culture of deep learning, but more particularly knowing it cannot succeed in isolation, engaging with stakeholders, nurturing wider partnerships to become a good ancestor. And all of that ethos, I think, um, uh, has been captured in some of the more detailed projects that you've been hearing about. So a final thought for me, um, 
when the wind of change blows as it is blowing really hard for the world at the moment um, do we build walls which is what some people are doing or do we build windmills which i think is what open learning and schools of tomorrow are trying in their different ways to do something about so that gives us uh something to think about for sure about maybe looking at this thing that's coming up around doing things together really substantially i'm going to uh, open up to a conversation also um, opening it up for conversation or questions between the panelists so we're now becoming one group without the hierarchy of speakers and non-speakers uh, so please do uh, whoever feels comfortable put your cameras on and um, I see uh, Megan Toms, you had a question. You're very welcome to uh, um, ask um, or comment. I was going to just start off. Um, we're, we're going to have a, a small conversation and then maybe uh, Dee Halligan uh, will uh, put it together as kind of reflections of what we've learned from Make It Open and the connection to open learning. Uh, Megan's just written, she's in the library. So if you want to uh, uh, put your point uh, in the text, I can read it out. But right now uh, she's saying, uh, thank you um, to uh, and applauding all the speakers. Very inspiring. So I'm passing that on. Uh, Dee, would you like to pick up? Yeah, I'd love to ask Malcolm a question, just from the point of view of, um, I mean, I'll be talking a little bit about our uh, relationship with open schooling and our continuing work in open learning. But in terms of your experience um, over the last 10 years and more, um, what do you see as the as the barriers, are we are we talking about a political context or a, or a, or a, you know those barriers to the changing of school cultures to get to that kind of um, uh, vision that you shared that was so inspiring? Heidi, thanks for the question. Um, I think it is the case that the, uh, the policy, the governmental environment, has not been supportive um, of what we're talking about um, and that is uh, quite an obstacle I think um, it remains the case that there are many examples where uh, schools through high quality leadership and through risk-taking leadership have overcome uh, those barriers. Um, I think the big barriers are the ones I didn't say very much about in the slide um, about uh, carpenters and gardeners. Um, as, a, as, a, as a system, we have not paid sufficient attention to families and to the early years in order to create a climate and also to build parental understanding and confidence. Um, we have a barrier of uh, equity. Um, we know that uh, uh, for uh, children and young people from more disadvantaged backgrounds, they make uh, less progress than they should do. And part of that, I would suggest, is because of the way that we try to educate them uh, under current uh, philosophies. Um, and we have a flawed accountability system, which is a barrier uh, and tends to drive focus um, into quite narrow goals for uh, schools and for education. So I think those are three barriers. Um, I think it can take brave and powerful leadership to overcome those. Um, and within Schools of Tomorrow, we all often talk about living and leading on the second horizon. Um, uh, the first horizon is, um, it's an analogy drawn from the energy industry, actually. The first horizon is the status quo, which we know can't survive in energy terms. We can't go on using energy as we can do at the moment, and we can't go on running schools um, uh, and judging schools in the way that we do at the moment. It will collapse sooner or later. Um, there are people who are able to start out with sort of green shoots um, and blue skies thinking because uh, circumstances allow that but they're not yet a majority um, they're not yet um, of a scalable or critical mass um, somewhere between those first and 
distant third horizons, there is a second horizon, which will be different for different schools um, and different people. Um, and it's trying to make sense of how can we push towards the vision that we have whilst being mindful of the constraints of today, which are real and need to be faced up to. Um, uh, in the in the context in which we find ourselves, which again is unique and different for everybody. So they're my barriers. Um, leadership and risk taking is a part of it, um, but we need to support each other in, in finding the steps that are appropriate for our situation. Sorry, that was a bit long winded, but it was a big question and an important one. Yeah, I'm, I, I think there are a few people who have been working in this area, like Lucy O'Rourke uh, from uh, education side and uh, Emily Culler from uh, local government. And I see it. Uh, thanks for joining us. So Emily uh, was also part of the advisory team coming from uh, expertise of working with communities around climate change. Um, so, uh, yeah, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And thank you to all the speakers. I think, yeah, I do not have an educational background at all. So it's so inspiring to hear um, examples of working with communities and working with local councils, but from an educational point of view. So thank you for all the work you're doing. And I think, yeah, Malcolm, you painted an amazing kind of big, big picture of like what you'd like the system to look like in the future. But I think what is so exciting about this project Maker Open is it's it's super practical and it's kind of starting that change from within the system um, and I think even the fact that there's been thousands of children young people who have like got that experience through this program is amazing so just hats off I guess to everyone who's been involved I guess my question is is maybe for Rose and Anna and it's, it's I guess about the storytelling side of things because it feels like all the materials are there and all the kind of toolkits and like things to get started but it, it feels like the kind of teacher's experience of like this is what it was like for me this is what we did this is how we made it relevant to our local context are the things that I don't know could help this to, to spread so I guess that's the question is like how could we how could we capture and share those stories from this program so that it can have a wider impact yeah I think a really good point um making the teachers and the leaders who are driving this forward in their schools, the protagonists of that story, is definitely crucial to lowering the barriers to entry for future, um, for their future peers that then want to replicate it and to build on it. Um, the one barrier to that happening is the teachers having the time and resources to be able to tell those stories. The second barrier is having the platform for those stories to be shared. Um, so those would be, I guess, yeah, two key challenges that would need to be overcome. Other protagonists of stories that I could think of that would be really impactful would be the stories of the students themselves, the young people themselves, in a lot of what I do is teaching scientists how to be better storytellers. So if to incorporate storytelling into the scientific process um, as part of the Maker Open scheme, I think would be really powerful because it would teach science communication as well as those storytelling skills and have the added benefit of those stories being to, able to go on to benefit the scheme and to open it up to others in the future. So yeah. that would mean maker education, science, storytelling. We'd add another layer now to, that's interesting. Uh, uh, Rose, did you want to pitch in on this or should we take one more question? Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, I, I completely um, completely agree um, with what Anna's saying. Um, I just think at the moment, I suppose from my point of view as a educator who's also on social media, I feel like, and I've also been teaching for 20 years, I feel like it's shifted. I think it's starting to, maybe it's starting to shift back to sort of allowing, because I don't know, the, the driver at the moment is knowledge, 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 and it's not making connections and deeper thinking uh, sometimes as much. Um, and I think, uh, you know, this this kind of project provides such a rich context um, you know, I think if we can share that and like you say, you know, encourage the children to share 
um their stories and give them a platform to do that then hopefully yeah. it will yeah it will there, there have been programs well. that have tried this and uh, we're lucky also to lucy o'rourke is here uh, director of project programs at uh, helen hamlin trust who has run philosophy in schools and various other projects so maybe hi lucy uh, hi. Great to be here uh, <laughs> i thought maybe you could also uh join us if you have any uh, response yeah i just think it's great in 20 years time everyone will be doing it if, if you look at forest schools you know that took 20 years before it was a thing and you mentioned it and everybody knows what it is all of a sudden um but i i mean it's been brilliant listening to everybody um absolutely i think one of the one of the uh barriers is teacher confidence because of the context it, you know political etc um so anything that can build you know school leaders and teachers confidence to do what they believe in and what they really kind of actually want to do is valuable and that that's where the storytelling is fundamental you know that's what's going to light the small fires that hopefully will will spread in a positive way rather than a negative one. <laughs> uh, so this, the, there is a question kind of lurking here. Who is the, who is the, who the, should the carrier be? Is it, who should the focus be on? And in this project, Make It Open, the focus was on teachers. Well. Drive the change. What, what was your kind of experience and kind of reflection on the, who can drive the change? Well, it my what I picked up on was when Rose said that the project provided a focus for change. And that was my experience because we were introducing philosophy for children, gardening, growing, harvesting, cooking your own food and making short films about everything that you're doing in school and sharing them on a YouTube for primary schools. Um, and it's that provides the focus and you know what happened was then the whole school community got involved and there's been a lot of discussion about parents being involved the wider community the local authority you know uh, and it's it is thinking about I always said that relationships are central to these things you know the teacher has a relationship with the child the child's got the parents the community you know it's, it's about feeding relationships you're doing it's very much a doing project you're not talking about it you're not theorizing you're not debating you're doing stuff with the children who have agency is another word so it it is the doing bit that creates the change I think you know at, at, at this particular time I don't think we need to be prisoners of policy frankly um, because there are there are examples, there are lots of examples, and you know Malcolm is one, and there are others uh, of schools that are doing a very providing their children with a very forward thinking. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's a point where we have to kind of open up to the relationship of schools to other ways that people are learning, and I yeah. like to put that question over to D. And I love it, Lucy, that you've, um, I love this phrase, not to be prisoners of policy, because while I was asking about barriers, you've been talking about breaking the barriers down. And I think that's a really good way to, to kind of finish this session. I will share screen and I'm Dee Halligan. I'm Daniel's co-director at Forth. Um, and I ran the early part of the project when we were really looking at definitions. So these lovely kinds of diagrams where we're trying to relate the different kinds of learning that we're talking about, how open learning relates to open schooling, how that relates to a field of science education, because everything is overlapping and crisscrossing and each has its own value and has its own kind of interdependent relationships. And we wanted to be quite careful about our definitions at the beginning because because everything starts to get very open the minute you start talking about open, including the definitions of open learning. And we spend quite a lot of time at the beginning trying to, trying to pin down a shared understanding between what were 
10 partners in European countries with 10 different languages or, you know, speaking through broken English. And, and, and when you start to look at how these dimensions, as we call them, could be more or less open and combined in different ways, it started to get very, very open. And that open, that very openness can be exclusive. It, you know, it sounds inclusive, but actually people don't, you know, especially teachers. And we started this project in the middle of COVID. Teachers did not want lots of questions about it. They wanted, you know, practical actions they could take that, as Malcolm said, relate back to 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 um, to 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 research that it's that 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 their confidence it's effective and could open up um, possibility for their learners. So we we we've done three years working in this field. We are looking forward to now, I think, because I feel like open schooling has kind of given us a language um, to describe work that we were doing already. So we were doing it already. Lots of teachers are doing it already. There's something about the vocabulary of it, not the formula of it, that gives us something to work within. So it can be challenging, as we've been hearing, to initiate and sustain. And I loved hearing about, Rose, you're so infectious with the kind of, you know, I, I was doing this and then suddenly I was doing this and then suddenly it grew to this. And, you know, in the same way that Lynn, when she was talking about it was a small project, it, it is now 4000 organizations in in 31 countries. You know, there's something about it that serves a need and people are responding. Um, uh, and so maybe maybe we're close to that tipping point that and the second horizon that Malcolm is uh, is talking about. And I'd prefer to think that we're closer to that than further away. But we're talking about relevance here. We're talking about untapped potential. But that thing about barriers to entry is really is really critical. And so that's why we think programs that make it open are important, because for for all the risks we take between kind of formulating it and dumbing it down, we also know that understanding and access, I understand what you're talking about, that I can do it, I can do it quickly, and then I can figure out how it works for my situation. So schools can enter into this conversation with an ease of adoption, they can repeat it and adapt it exactly, uh, exactly as Rose was saying. And then open schooling becomes that, that culture and, and infrastructure. I think, Anna, when you were talking about open schooling, it almost became like an infrastructure that you can work within, that you don't have to reinvent it every time, that you can access it. And I think that's really what we're, what we're fighting, what we're fighting for, it just feel like fighting sometimes. Um, so the Make It Open activity that is very slowly loading on my screens, hopefully on yours, you know, we, we created the pilots and the case studies, we've created some tools, we've created some support. Sometimes that felt like overcomplicating it almost, and we have to kind of retreat from that but we're certainly thinking about what that legacy looks like and how that becomes accessible for UK schools or for English schools under their English curriculum, how we can relate that back to the various curricula under, under UK, Scotland, or, or England, Scotland and Wales and how we can kind of maintain that. So we're not dropping any of that activity though the project is closing. And I'll just, um, oh yeah, and then we've got a whole world which is opening up as the European funded projects, which are obviously more, um, difficult for uh, UK institutions to access and somehow we seem to have found a way in not just once but now twice and um, there's a there's a there's a growing agenda and therefore a growing evidence base and a growing network that we can have access to so all of these projects as you see make it open is down the bottom of that list of projects there's another Ferroclos has got a British partner on it you know these are not these are not things which are happening um, apart from us, it's potentially as things regularize in our relationship with um, the EU Commission, there are things that we can access and we can continue to collaborate with. So that's our hope, I guess. And we're part of one of those further projects, a project called Levers, and this starts to work outside of open schooling into what was broadly categorized as open learning. And again, another broad term, but we are talking about, you know, what we've become familiar with in today's talk, enhanced learning opportunities within formal education systems or widening learning opportunities beyond formal education systems. And I quite like this kind of stretchy, elastic um, term because it starts to bring us back to this idea that, you know, as Andrea's question, you know, if you are to, if you are an informal learning institution, if you are working um, with non-formal courses and programs, you know, there's this kind of dialogue between them as partners, between us as partners starts to become, you know, those barriers become more permeable and those partnerships become, be, become more accessible and those, 
that can become the culture of open learning that we're talking about. Now, I've, I found this quite hilarious as a grid following on from the previous grid, because that's 2017. And I think with COVID as an accelerator, there's a big, you know, that question mark there is a huge question mark. Really does formal learning only happen in, you know, institutions and universities and vocational education providers? It's all over the map now. And I think a lot, a lot, of, a lot of this conversation is where do these happen and who is leading them? And is it always a teacher that initiates or can it be that museum who initiates and how do we create those networks? So these are all challenges that we're taking on board as we're, as we're looking toward that second horizon. <laughs> and looking at a move toward, toward more learner focused institution in the form of, well, the language that we're starting to use a bit is learning ecosystems, learning partnerships, learning networks. And that's where we're, where we're addressing our energies in the face of, you know, the world that Malcolm described really, really um, emphatically. This is, a, this is an illustration from a Green New Deal you know, any of the, any of the, you can, you can look at any point on this map and think about the transformation that is, that is required um, across, and you know, all of these in terms of industry, in terms of uh, workforce learning, in terms of upskilling and reskilling, it sits, you know, the, the, the school only as a kind of an entry point to all of this change. And I think that's why we see this work as critical and we see it particularly critical in the, and I'm going to just throw this up here <laughs> and then take it away again, but we're very much seeing our efforts assisting in the context of a changing city, changing learning institutions and how we're all kind of contributing to a vision of the of the common good being served by these kinds of projects. Um, and yeah, we're we're <laughs> I'm just putting this out there that it's changing our practice and I can see everything, you know, I saw Rose transformed by the conversation that you're having over the last year. You know, Lu Lucy, I know you know this is a this is a lifelong effort. And I think increasingly it's starting to center itself in our practice where we might once upon a time have looked at public programs in a very general sense. I think we're really talking about the formats, model, models and spaces for engagement and learning as kind of centered in the efforts that we're making. And the last slide is just the, the project that Make It Open is directly connecting to now as a project that we started in March this year, which is called Learning Ventures for Climate Justice or Leavers. And we're looking at an asset-based approach to community climate learning. Again, if, if, if Make It Open was looking at the schools as centre, we're looking at the potential for other institutions to work collaboratively with schools, again, through open learning ecosystems and networks. We're part of OS Together, so directly building on Make It Open. Um, I feel like I've just gone into the shade there. That is the last slide of our presentation for this afternoon. I feel like I cut yeah. off a really rich conversation, but I'm also aware of people's time, and this really is focused on showcasing the schools as part of Make It Open, not necessarily our way forward, but I would like to think that everyone in this conversation this afternoon, we could be continuing the conversation with because it's very much connected um, and, there's, and, there's, and there's definitely room for all of us as we build our skills in this conversation. So I'll leave it there and go back to Daniel. So thank you, Dee, thank you, Malcolm, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Rose, and also to our guests that joined and the advisory group. I'm very aware that we showed a lot of uh, case studies and that's what they are right now and the question is if the model they are part of can become something that grows um, so thank you very much and um, we'll see you hopefully in the next project or other projects um, so thank you for joining the make it open showcase have a very Thanks, nice Daniel. thank you bye bye